All right, hi everyone. I hope you guys are having a great day. So this video is going to start our material for exam three. So exam two is going to close at noon, 12 p.m. on February 24th. So please make sure that you take the test before it closes. Now after that exam closes, I will go in and make sure that all students receive full, uh, full credit for those two opinion questions. So you may see your grade go up a little bit after the exam closes. Let me know if you have any questions about your grades. I will be posting midterm grades um, probably at some point during this week. But do let me know if you have questions. So as I said, today we're going to be starting the material for the next section of the class. So in today's video, we're going to start talking about adolescence. So during this third section, we're going to talk about adolescence, young adulthood, and then we're going to wrap up this third section talking about work-related issues. Okay? So if you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and get started. All right, so as I said, today we're going to be starting off with Chapter 8, which is going to be about physical and cognitive development in adolescence. And then we are also going to start the slides on social development in adolescence as well. So we've moved into a different stage of life now. We've kind of gotten out of childhood. Now we're into adolescence. There's not necessarily a specific age range associated with adolescence. There are a lot of different things that you might consider as being part of adolescence. Um, there may be an argument that adolescence is something that starts with puberty. Um, and that could be one potential beginning point of adolescence. Then we have to figure out when adolescence ends uh, and when adulthood begins, which is, of course, a complicated issue. But if we're thinking about puberty as being a major sign that someone is beginning adolescence, then what do we mean when we're talking about puberty? Well, we know that puberty involves some pretty dramatic hormonal changes um, that kind of cause a shift from a child body into an adult body, so kind of shifting into young adulthood here. We're going to see a couple of major things happening. One, we're going to see some significant uh, physical growth in general. So it talks about height, weight, and changes in body fat and muscle content, but then this is going to be different as you'll see for boys and girls. Girls are going to see more of an increase in body fat. Uh, boys are going to see more of an increase in muscle. And then also we're going to see changes in reproductive organs. So we're going to see things like um, something that marks the beginning of fertility. So we're going to talk about girls starting their periods, that kind of thing. Uh, and then we're also going to talk about some secondary sexual characteristics um, that don't necessarily involve fertility per se, but are physical signs that someone is becoming more developed and potentially is becoming fertile. Because that's what puberty is all about, right? So you usually have this period of growth that starts um, around the time of puberty. But one thing that we do see is that girls are going to start this growth spurt before boys on average. Now this is on average. You may see some individual differences, but typically girls go through this growth spurt a little bit earlier. And so there can be this kind of awkward stage for girls when they might be much taller than their uh, male classmates. So we're going to see gains of 15 to 17 pounds a year. So we're putting on weight, we're putting on height. Um, we're also going to see changes in muscle fibers, heart and lung capacity increasing here. And this may be correlating with a time when adolescents might be having more physical activity because of being involved in things like sports. It does mention that this is more so for boys and also that uh, muscle is going to be increasing for boys while body fat is increasing more for girls. So you can see from a fertility standpoint um, why this might be um, helpful. So a woman's body requires a higher uh, body fat content to be able to uh, get pregnant, to be able to carry a child, and then to be able to um, nurse a child later. You need fat stores to be able to produce milk. And so it would make sense as your body is getting ready uh, for fertility um, that girls would need an increase in body fat. All right, so what about biological development when it comes to the brain? Well, what we're going to see is that at the beginning of adolescence, the brain is almost completely at its adult size. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that it is completely mature, though. There are some processes that are wrapping up in some ways. It talks about myelination and synaptic pruning. So um, I believe we may have touched on this before, but when we're talking about myelination, when you have a neuron, those cells in your nervous system, 
um, there is a long portion of the neuron called the axon. And so remember that information comes in the dendrite, travels down the axon to the end of the neuron to the terminal junctions or terminal buttons, different uh, words you can use for that. So the axon is going to be coated in this myelin sheath, this fatty substance that would then increase the speed of transmission for these messages. So you're not born with your neurons fully myelinated, with your axons fully covered in the, this myelin sheath. That's something that is continuing on through adolescence, um, and but that's something that's going to be kind of wrapping up here. And synaptic pruning, so basically getting rid of those connections that are not being used. Um, so this is happening so that your brain can be more efficient in its processing. So you will see changes in uh, cognitive abilities because there is a physical, biological development happening with the brain. It talks about the limbic system reaching maturity, and the limbic system does play a role in emotions. Usually that's what you think of when you think about the limbic system, but it can also be related to things like reward, pleasure. However, the frontal cortex is going to continue developing. It's thought that that frontal lobe of your brain doesn't fully develop until around age 25. And so that frontal lobe is going to be handling things like decision making, thought processes. This is where your personality lives. And so this may be why we see some uh, poor decision making. Now there are other reasons too, I think, why teenagers don't always make the best decisions. But part of that could be that their frontal lobe is not fully developed. And part of that is you kind of lack the wisdom that you can acquire from you know, being on this earth longer. All right, good. So we're seeing changes here um, primarily caused by hormones. So it talks about the pituitary here releasing growth hormone. You have this major growth spurt gains in both height and weight. Uh, but we're also seeing differences in your hormones related to puberty. So we're going to see increases in estrogen in girls and testosterone in boys. And this is going to play a role in this puberty developing here. So we do know that girls also have testosterone and boys also have estrogen, but they would have smaller amounts, whereas girls typically have higher levels of estrogen and boys typically have higher levels of testosterone. When will puberty start? If we conceptualize adolescence, as starting around the time that puberty starts, then that would mean that different people enter adolescence at different times because puberty happens differently for different people. Um, there are lots of different things that impact that. We're going to talk more about this coming up. But one thing that we see is that it is highly genetic so that if a parent has puberty earlier, then their children also may as well. But then also your environment, health, nutrition, the amount of stress that someone is under, those are also important factors in when puberty starts. So one thing that we think about when we think about puberty in girls, we would think about the beginning of menstruation. So we think about a girl starting her period. Um, and what we're going to see is that girls tend to start getting their period earlier in, as it says, countries or socioeconomic statuses um, where there's better nutrition, better health care. So if you think about a young girl's body making decisions about when would be a good time uh, to start getting your period, then it would make sense that a girl would start getting her period when her body thinks that she is ready to be an adult and to have children herself. Now that's not me saying that just because a girl is getting her period that means that she should have children necessarily right away. Certainly not what I'm saying, but what I'm saying is that your body has to make decisions. So if you have adequate nutrition and health care, if you are healthy in general, then that might be a signal to your body that you could be ready to carry a baby. If you're not healthy, if you're malnourished, for example, then your body might say it would be dangerous if she were to get pregnant. You think about your body making these decisions, but your body knows that it would be dangerous to get pregnant when you're already malnourished, and so potentially that would cause fertility to decrease or a period not to start. One thing that we do see, though, is that girls are more likely to hit puberty earlier when they are in stressful environments. And there are a couple of examples listed here um, when they've received that kind of authoritarian parenting, especially from mothers um, or stressful relationships for themselves, maybe conflict in the home, maybe conflict among their parents. Um, so the thought here is that your stress hormones, things like cortisol, 
that stress level being higher kind of signals to the body that you need to grow up. You need to become an adult. You're going to have to take care of yourself. You can't trust other people to take care of you. So there's actually some research to suggest that when, uh, especially fathers, are very uh, loving and caring and you know, appropriately attentive here, then girls tend to um, start puberty a little bit later. But when there's a lot of stress in the home, then in stressful environments in general, then girls tend to hit puberty a little bit earlier. All right, so thinking about the psychological impact of puberty, as your body is changing, then you have to uh, make sense of that and decide whether or not you like your new body. And I think part of this has to do with culture and with um, things like media and uh, movies and TV shows and magazines as far as whether or not we're happy with our bodies. Girls are more critical than boys of their appearance and maybe um, because they get together in groups and criticize themselves and other people's appearances uh, and this can cause girls to be very dissatisfied. We are going to talk later uh, today about eating disorders and that's something that is not exclusively in girls but more likely to see that in girls than in boys. On the other hand, boys are more likely to be pleased with the changes in their appearance so we talked about during puberty, girls tend to gain more body fat, whereas boys tend to gain more muscle. And so potentially um, boys might consider this as a more positive change. Um, but one thing that we see is that boys don't usually report comparing themselves to their peers. They perhaps compare themselves to um, what they think of as this body image of the ideal man. Um, so maybe this could be something to do with the media here. We spend a lot of time talking about little girls playing with Barbie dolls that have unrealistic body types. And I don't disagree with that, but also if you look at the superhero toys that little boys play with, I mean, Spider-Man has like 27 abs. And I didn't think Peter Parker was like that. Um, so maybe we're setting up unrealistic um, expectations for both boys and girls. All right, so what else is happening with our hormones? Well, we do see that as hormones change, this seems to be correlated with irritability and impulsivity. So you can see um, that, once again, teenagers may not make the best decisions. Um, their frontal lobe is not fully developed. Potentially, the changes in hormones might lead to them behaving a little bit more impulsively. However, it seems like the moodiness, kind of that easy um, temper or that shift in mood quite a bit, is something that we do see happening in adolescence but does not seem to be correlated with hormones necessarily. The thought is that the um, mood issues that we not always but oftentimes see in adolescence is actually caused more by the environment because of the changes in their social settings, because of uh, the changes in their peer relationships. It's, it's a stressful time period is basically what we're getting at. So while all of these things are happening with your body, with you know, physical development, hormones and such, we also have a lot of social things changing, a lot of really important decisions that we're expecting kids to make about the future during this time period. And so that may be more the cause of mood shifts than hormones, although hormones might get the blame for that a pretty good bit. All right, so if we're thinking about the age at which puberty begins, um, once again, this is something that is based on genetics, it's based on nutrition, it's based on stress levels. Um, when it talks here about early matures, so we're going to see some kids hitting puberty earlier and showing some of those uh, secondary sex characteristics, um, things like facial hair uh, in boys or maybe breast development in girls, that kind of thing. Um, we're going to be seeing that in some earlier than others. And so this is a little bit scary when you think about this, but um, nine-year-olds and even younger potentially, uh, girls could be having uh, some early symptoms of puberty. Uh, and then it says 11 in boys, girls usually hitting puberty a little bit before boys here. Um, and so this would be what we would consider an early mature, but then on the late hand, there's, or the other hand rather, there are some kids who develop a little bit later. 15 to 16 for boys, 14 to 15 for girls. Most people are going to fall in between these ranges. And one thing you're going to see is that there is a certain level of uh, nutrition and health that is necessary 
Uh, for example, if a girl has um, severe uh, nutrition issues, maybe in, uh, ac you know, not having access to nutritious food, being very malnourished, or having an eating disorder, um, then we might see that she might still not have her period even at 15, 16. Uh, your period can go away at any point um, if a body is not healthy, especially with nutrition. It's something important to consider. So when we're talking about early maturation, there are some correlations between um, developing earlier and some negative outcomes, things like sexual activity uh, at an earlier age, increased risk of teen pregnancy, that kind of thing. Um, but we're seeing that this might vary among ethnic groups. One thing that we see is that um, the actual number of girls who are maturing earlier may vary based on ethnic group. And this might have something to do with stress level, access to health care, that kind of thing. Um, but then also, I think that parenting plays a role here as well. Uh, and so parents might have to kind of change their parenting strategy a little bit if they have kids who reach puberty uh, earlier than others. All right, so let's think about the nutrition that is required. Now, I don't have kids that are adolescents yet. Every year we get closer, though, and I get more and more afraid of this time period. But stereotypically, you hear about uh, teenagers, especially teenage boys, eating you out of house and home, right? Well, one of the reasons for that is that this is a period of extreme growth, and so the metabolism rates are growing up, and so you do need more calories as a teenager than you did as a child. One thing that is especially important is to get extra iron. Um, this is necessary for developing muscles, and we know that's happening for both boys and girls, but especially for boys. But then also an increase in iron may be necessary to help girls replace lost blood. So we're thinking about girls who are starting their period here, and that may increase their risk for being anemic. So may need uh, an iron supplement or just making sure that you get an iron-rich diet, as well as making sure that you get adequate calcium for all of the bone development that's happening here. One concern is that um, we're not always feeding our teenagers the healthiest things. And when you're hungry, you know, you eat whatever is available. And there's certainly an argument to be made about what kinds of food should be uh, encouraged at school, that kind of thing. But what we do see is that most teens in this country eat enough calories, but they're not the right kinds of calories. They're not the healthiest food choices. Um, although I guess all of us could fall in this category. I think we could probably also say the same thing about college students who are stereotypically eating a lot of frozen pizzas and Hot Pockets. All right, now if we're going to be talking about nutrition, we need to briefly discuss eating disorders. Now, eating disorders can happen at other uh, periods of life, but we do often see the symptoms beginning during adolescence because we do see an increase in weight happening naturally when puberty hits. Uh, and then also there is the peer pressure and the social issues that come along with those teenage years. So. A couple of eating disorders, these are not the only eating disorders, but probably the two that are talked about the most, uh, anorexia and bulimia. So anorexia and bulimia both involve having distorted views about yourself and about food. Uh, and so they can both involve girls who are very uh, weight conscious, who are um, ruminating, thinking a lot about food, planning food, thinking about food a good deal. Uh, but there are some differences here. With anorexia, you're going to see the main feature is that they usually have a significant decrease in body weight. And so although they may be afraid of being overweight or think that they are overweight, they're usually substantially below the weight that would be expected. So anorexia primarily involves severely restricting calories, and this may also involve uh, significant exercise, that kind of thing. Anorexia is very dangerous because of that uh, very low weight. So you need that nutrition uh, to be healthy, to thrive, uh, to stay alive. And so sometimes um, there are, unfortunately, uh, individuals who do not get help soon enough uh, and may unfortunately pass away uh, from anorexia. So it is certainly a very serious disorder. Bulimia, also a serious disorder. There are some differences with bulimia. First of all, usually... Um, the individuals who are suffering from bulimia are typically of average weight um, and or maybe slightly above average weight but what's happening is that you have a period where they binge and then you have a purge and so during that binge session 
someone will eat a very large number of calories in a very short period of time. It's usually um, very high calorie food, something that is easy to eat um, because you're trying to eat a lot in a short period of time. So oftentimes the person will feel very stressed out, anxious, tense, and they'll have a binge because it will make them feel better. And this can happen um, rarely or it could be up to 30 times per week, which you can see how this could have a significant impact on your health. And so after the binge happens, um, so the binge may make them feel better during the process, but then afterwards they'll feel guilty about it and they'll have a desire to try to undo that. And so the stereotypical way you think of someone uh, purging would be vomiting, but also using laxatives or exercising excessively could also be considered a purge. Um, first of all, this is terrible for someone's health. Um, but second of all, things like vomiting, using laxatives, they're usually not very um, effective at removing those calories from your body. Um, so what we're seeing here is that people have a, a very significant fear of becoming overweight and then they react to it differently depending on the disorder that develops. So we want to encourage a healthy diet. We also want to encourage a healthy level of exercise, knowing that it is possible for someone to take this too far. And you can see eating disorders in men as well. It's less common, but one reason why I think it's not diagnosed as much is because sometimes men purge by exercising, which is something we typically don't think of when we think of bulimia and may not recognize it as a disorder. So it would be great for teenagers to engage in exercise here. Um, sports might be a way for kids to have uh, this exercise. And one thing you want to do is you want to make sure that the exercise is regular. It talks about at least three times a week and that it does increase your heart rate um, because this is something that's good for your body, good for your cardiovascular system to have exercise that's appropriate, not excessive, but appropriate here. So sports could be one way to do this, but it wouldn't necessarily have to be a team sport or even an organized thing. Just getting out playing with your friends can be really helpful. Unfortunately, you also have to keep an eye on the potential for steroid use. Um, we talked about how girls might feel like they have to compete with Barbie, but boys might feel like they have to compete with uh, the toys that show you know, all these muscles that just really are not very realistic or feeling like they need to use steroids to be successful in athletics. Um, it talks about recovering from injury, that kind of thing. And so steroids have very significant health risks. Um, but once again, thinking about the fact that teenagers are not necessarily set up to make the best decisions, it would be great if we were watching out for signs of uh, steroid use. All right, so how does information processing change during adolescence? We think of adolescence as a time where there's a lot going on physically, biologically, and there's a lot going on socially. But as far as cognitive development goes, it's not as drastic uh, as far as the development during adolescence. It's basically just a tweaking of the way you thought as a child. It's kind of gradually shaping towards the way you will think as an adult. Um, so there are some changes that are taking place here, but they're not usually drastic changes. It talks about the speed doesn't change too much after age 12. Remembering that the speed is going to be associated with myelination. So as their axons become coated in that myelin sheath, then that's going to allow this um, transmission to happen faster. Um, so that's something that's correlated with myelination. Um, adolescents working memory capability is about the same as younger adults. Now we do know, and you'll see this later, that um, older adults can have a loss in working memory, um, but adolescents are about the same as younger adults. Um, and we talked about myelination being important here because uh, we want to make sure that our nervous system is happening at its peak efficiency. There are certain health conditions, uh, multiple sclerosis being one, where there's a breakdown of that myelin sheath, uh, which can then cause a lot of problems because um, the transmission uh, isn't working smoothly throughout your nervous system. So very important process here. What about your knowledge during adolescence? Um, this is a time period that probably you're not that far removed from, or perhaps maybe you even still consider yourself an adolescent. Maybe some of you do. Um, some of you are a little bit older. But the, the idea is that adolescents certainly think that they know quite a lot, and it is true that they are knowledgeable in certain domains. And there are some things that adolescents know that adults don't know. 
and this is something that I enjoy teaching college classes. I feel like I learn terminology and um, pop culture references. I feel like my students keep me relevant, basically. Um, so then the knowledge that you gain during adolescence uh, allows them to have practice with organizing information, learning new experiences. Um, basically, we are building on our knowledge base that started as a child, is going to continue to build, and thinking about development as a lifelong process, this gaining of knowledge is not something that ever stops, but certainly is something that's happening a lot during this adolescent time period. So it talks about strategies here. We talked about how meta memory, for example, refers to what we know about our memory skills. Metacognition, the same thing, what we know about our cognitive skills and our cognitive development. So adolescents may have enough experience as well as enough biological development to have some task specific strategies. So you have different strategies for different types of tests, for example. You know how to study for a multiple choice test versus an essay test. Or you know how to study for an English test versus a math test. And so they have task specific strategies and they're able to monitor their outcomes to see if those strategies are working or do they need to change them a little bit. And they're certainly learning some uh, more efficient ways of studying compared with the way that younger children study. It talks about outlining. I would say outlining is something that is um, really helpful. Um, making your own study guide. Um, highlighting, eh, kind of mixed on the results there. Unfortunately, sometimes we feel like we over-highlight. We may highlight things too much. And then if we end up highlighting the entire text, we're not really doing any good with our highlighting. But outlining is helpful. Creating a study plan based on the material that they know best versus the material that they don't know very well. So do I just need a quick refresher? Making sure that we're spending our study time appropriately, focusing primarily on the areas that we don't know very well. These are skills that we're learning probably during adolescence. So usually also during adolescence you're getting some real world practice at solving problems maybe as you get a little bit older and your parents potentially allow for a little bit more independence um, we see that children before they reach adolescence tend to use these heuristics these rules of thumb um, basically just kind of general rules uh, and not necessarily thinking logically about them you know kids acquire these rules and really that early childhood middle childhood is a time for memorization uh, but I think it's unfortunate that so many of our rules that we memorize have exceptions to them for example I'm trying to teach my kids how to spell and I know for every spelling rule that I teach them there are tons of exceptions to those rules so you can't just memorize these little rules. You have to also be able to think logically about them, be flexible with them, know when to use that rule and when not to use that rule. So adolescents tend to be very skilled in making arguments. I think a lot of teenagers make really excellent lawyers. And I think that my daughter, who is still in middle childhood, already is showing skills that she could totally be a lawyer. This is going to be really interesting when she's a teenager. But um, the point here is that they are typically good at thinking logically, especially if there's something in it for them, if they can find a way to um, benefit from talking you into something. Having said that, though, that does not mean just because they know how to use logic doesn't mean they always will. And this is also true for adults. Sometimes, even though we as adults are able to use logic, we don't always, right? So sometimes our beliefs or maybe our emotions or what we want to be true can impact with our logical thoughts. And that's not something that happens just with teenagers, although we do tend to give them a hard time about it. All right. Uh, thinking about your cognitive development, we need to talk about changes in morality. So Kohlberg's theory was all about the development of morality, your personal sense of right and wrong. And so Kohlberg would say that we go through these stages of development in our moral thinking and that you go through these stages in this order, that the order is not flexible, you go through the stages in this order, and that um, not everyone will get all the way through all the stages, but you will go through them in order. So according to Kohlberg, the first level of morality is pre-conventional. So during this pre-conventional stage, our morality is all about punishment and reward. So a child does not hit because they don't want to go in timeout. Or a child does their homework 
because they want to get a gold star sticker on their paper or because they don't want to lose privileges. I mean, so it's trying to gain a reward or avoid a punishment. Now, within this level, there may be some differences here. Maybe early on, we just do it because we want to obey what the authority figure says, which would mean that we wouldn't necessarily engage in a moral behavior unless we're told to, right? So I tell my kid to share, therefore they share. On the other hand, as kids start to develop through level one, they might decide to engage in these behaviors on their own without being told because that will then allow them to be in your good graces and get something for it. So I'm going to go clean my room, hoping that you'll take me to the movies later. So planning ahead a little bit more. So pre-conventional is all about getting good things and avoiding bad things, right? As we move up, to level two, the conventional stage, it's all about following what society says is right and wrong. So we have laws, we have social norms. So some of the things um, we have for social norms are also laws, right? So like you shouldn't attack someone, right, is, is a law. However, there are some social norms we have that are not associated with laws. Like for example, it is not illegal to cheat on your spouse. So we have social norms, we have these written or unwritten rules about what is right and what is wrong. And so during level two, we are primarily focused on following these social norms that are set up by other people because we want others to like us, we want to live up to their expectations, or because we understand that society wouldn't function if we didn't have this. So I didn't watch the movie The Purge, okay? I cared enough about it to read the Wikipedia page. I think I read the Wikipedia page. But the point is, there was a movie about one night, maybe some of you guys have seen the movie and could explain it better than I could, but one night a year, there were no laws, you could do whatever you wanted to, there were no police or anything like that. Obviously, society would crumble if we didn't have law and order, uh, and so we follow the rules because we know that's important for us to be successful as a society. And then when you get to level three, if you get to level three, and some people won't, okay, but if you get to level three, um, this is the post-conventional stage where you come up with your own moral code. This is where maybe you take the morality you were taught, but you decide whether or not you're going to apply it. Like, because of this situation, I don't have to stick to this moral contract or this social contract. Um, because you betrayed me, I don't have to do what is socially appropriate, that kind of thing. Or not even taking someone else's system and applying it the way you want to apply it, but maybe coming up with your own morality, your own view of what's right and wrong, which may be different from what your parents taught you and other significant people in your life taught you. So not everyone reaches level three. According to Kohlberg, though, you move progressively through the stages in this order. You don't skip stages, although you don't necessarily make it all the way through all of the stages. Now, there's been a lot of research on this. A lot of the research has to do with interviewing people and presenting them with moral situations and then seeing what they would do in that situation and having them explain why they made the decision that they made. So there is some research, longitudinal, so following the same people as they get older and develop, that shows that people don't usually skip stages. So that does support Kohlberg's theory. We also see that there is a link between your thinking about morality and your behavior. We know this is not always the case, right? Sometimes we have these really strong beliefs that are not always reflected in our behavior, but there is at least a correlation here. However, your morality is very situation dependent. There may be, it may be that you have a rule in your mind that stealing is wrong. However, you may be able to think of any number of situations where you might say, it's okay. It's okay if you're stealing um, food because you can't feed your family, like that kind of thing. So there may be certain situations in which you break your own moral code. And also, a lot of this has to do with culture. So Kohlberg's theory is primarily focusing on individualistic cultures, uh, less on collectivist cultures. So some cultures do go through this stage, but not every culture. Some cultures are not individualistic. So Kohlberg's theory has a lot to do with develop your own view of morality and apply it as you see fit. And that's kind of level three and the most advanced level of moral reasoning. 
But there are some cultures and some religions that focus not on developing your own moral code, but on following the moral code that is taught to you by others, or on having the preferred outcome be something good for other people, not just something good for yourself. And so in different cultures and with different religious beliefs, you may see different moral development. And I think that makes sense. So Kohlberg's theory is a good rule of thumb and generally seems to apply well to Western cultures, individualistic cultures, where we're thinking more about ourselves, but does not necessarily apply to every culture. Okay. All right. One last thing here before we're switching gears to a little bit today on social development and adolescence, we want to teach moral reasoning to our kids. We want our kids to be able to um, behave morally and have uh, a strong sense of morality. So where does this come from? Well, we need to have discussions with our kids about moral dilemmas and maybe giving them examples of situations we've been in, be prepared that your kids will throw this back at you. Like if you tell them the story of the time when you were a kid and you were tempted and you stole something that belonged to one of your cousins and you felt bad and apologized for it or whatever, your kids will never forget and they will constantly be telling you, remember that time you stole so-and-so's? So be prepared for that when you share things with your kids. Um, but we do tend to do well when someone who is older, more advanced in their morality, uh, helps us think through new situations, perhaps even helping us highlight the inconsistencies or that there's something about your morality or your viewpoint here that doesn't necessarily make sense. That can be really helpful. Um, also, religious involvement is something that is often associated with moral development. And so this is something that a parent would be responsible for based on your views on religion and what you want to pass on to your kids. Uh, making sure that they have uh, frequent uh, open discussions with you about religious issues can be really helpful for their moral reasoning as well. All right. As I said, today we are also going to start talking about social development, although we are not going to finish these slides today. But we are going to talk about a few of the social issues, and this is where we're going to have your activity. So as we're thinking about uh, social development in adolescence, one of the first things that comes to mind is a search for identity. So during adolescence, these teenage years, we're trying to figure out who we are and who we want to be. And so if we think about Erickson's theory that we have these um, conflicts, basically, that we have to resolve, and with each stage, if we handle that stage appropriately, we move on with resilience into the next stage, or perhaps we gain a struggle that we carry with us Erickson would say during adolescence you have this identity achievement versus identity confusion. The idea that you should be, as you're kind of exiting your adolescent period, you should have some strong understanding of who you are and to feel pretty good about that. And so it talks about the balance between selecting a single self and trying out possible selves. So on the one hand, you want to be consistent. Uh, with who you are. You want to figure out who you want to be and stick with it. But on the other hand, how can you figure out who you want to be unless you experiment a little bit with different versions of yourself? And so oftentimes in um, those high school teenage years, kids are trying to figure out what kind of person they want to be. And part of this might focus on career. So maybe they think about, you know, do I want to be a doctor? Do I want to be a nurse? Do I want to be an engineer? Do I want to be a psychologist? Do I want to be a teacher? And so as you are trying out these potential career roles, maybe you're thinking about the ones that are a good match for your personal skills and abilities, but also not just thinking about career decisions, but things like um, talents, what hobbies do you want to pursue, romance, we're going to talk about romance today, but then other relationships, religious beliefs, politics, I mean, there's so many things that you're trying to figure out. And keep in mind that an adolescent is trying to figure these things out while they are surrounded by peers who are also trying to figure these things out, which could be great because they could find a sense of community there, um, but could also be harmful because you might start modeling some behaviors that are not ideal that you're learning from peers. So certainly there are some problems with the way that adolescents think. And this goes back to the fact that your frontal lobe is not fully developed, but we talk about it here because it impacts your behaviors and your social interactions. 
just a few examples of some problems that can come up with adolescents. Um, adolescent egocentrism. Oftentimes, um, egocentrism refers to not being able to see someone else's perspective. And oftentimes, teenagers are focused entirely on their own experiences, their own feelings, their own thoughts. And so it gives an example here of having a death in the family and being worried about how funeral plans and other plans might impact what you had planned to do for the weekend instead of thinking about the loss and how that's impacted people around you. I'm sure you can think of examples about how adolescents tend to not think about other people. And I would suspect, at least suspect, I don't have research to support this, but I would think this would be worse in individualistic cultures where we kind of encourage people to think primarily about themselves. Imaginary audience here, oftentimes adolescents are very self-conscious. They feel like they are constantly being judged, constantly being criticized, maybe, maybe worried about bullying, that kind of thing. Personal fable, you know, teenagers tend to think that they are experiencing things differently, in a unique way, in a more intense way than anyone else. So this heartbreak that I'm experiencing is worse than any other heartbreak. And this love that I feel is stronger than the love that anyone else has ever felt. That's pretty, uh, pretty common for adolescents to think. And then this is one that's especially scary, this uh, kind of Superman way of thinking, illusion of invulnerability. The idea that bad things happen to other people, not to me. And so then maybe teenagers do things like have unsafe sex or drive in a manner that's not safe, drive too fast, use substances. Um, because they think dangerous things won't happen to them. I'm young and I'm going to live forever. And of course, we know that's not always the case, uh, but it can be certainly associated with some bad outcomes. So we're thinking about um, not thinking very well, right, as adolescents. We're thinking about gaining an identity, but also during adolescence, self-esteem is a major issue. So self-esteem, your view of yourself, whether you think of yourself as a generally good person or a bad person, a lot of this is going to come from a comparison with our peers. And so during the beginning of adolescence, we may see a decrease in self-esteem uh, because we compare ourselves with our peers and maybe feel like we found ourselves lacking. Although a lot of teenagers bounce back from this, maybe they start to think of themselves as, well, okay, so this person is better at me in math, but I'm better at this or that. So they find ways to flourish. They understand that they don't have to be good at everything. Although some adolescents will continue to struggle with self-esteem throughout this time period or even beyond. So one thing to note is that your social self-esteem is something that is usually not all or nothing. That it may be that we feel like I'm good with my friends, but I'm not good at my dating life. Or I'm good with my family or I'm not good with my friends. So you might feel differently about different relationships. And how you feel about yourself probably has a lot to do with your life experiences, the culture that you're a part of. Uh, religious beliefs can also play a role here. What kinds of peers do you spend time around? So certainly lots of things impacting your self-esteem. And we know that self-esteem is important because having low self-esteem is correlated with depression. However, we also know that there is a problem with having extremely high self-esteem because that's associated with narcissism. So there's a certain level in the middle that's um, ideal. So adolescent self-worth, self-esteem is higher if they believe they're skilled in domains they value. Um, and there can be some cognitive dissonance here, uh, basically where you manipulate the way you think so you can feel better about yourself. And so maybe the area in which you were skilled, because you're skilled in that area, you start to think it's more important. Or maybe because you think an area is important, you work hard at it and therefore become skilled. Uh, but this can be helpful also if they think that their peers think highly of them, which this can be dangerous because we know that the way that our peers think about us can change substantially in a short period of time. I'm sure you guys remember high school, right? which was not the most positive experience for everyone. Um, but self-esteem tends to be better if you have authoritative parenting. So parenting that involves that affection and love, but then also involves structures and rules. Uh, as you get older, you may need your parents, and parents may need to give a little bit more freedom, but that needs to be uh, based on someone's maturity level, appropriate levels of independence. We need to cons consistently still continue to have rules and discipline that are appropriate. Now, thinking about relationships with parents, 
relationships with parents continue to be important even into adolescence when you're thinking about peer relationships being so important parent relationships don't stop being important um, we have this myth that teenagers and parents are mortal enemies but the research doesn't really bear that out um, most adolescents love their parents and feel loved by their parents and they actually think that their parents know some stuff not necessarily that they know everything but that they do feel like they can turn to their parents for advice about at least some things however we do see that parent-child conflicts can escalate during adolescence um, probably because our frontal lobe is not fully developed so thinking from the teenagers perspective they're not necessarily prepared to make good decisions here uh, maybe because of hormones and things going on it's a stressful time period for them but then also from a parent's point of view it may be difficult to parent a teenager trying to figure out how much independence is okay and how much is too much and so because of that um, family therapy could be a great option here to help both parent and child now romantic relationships is really where we're going to spend the rest of today's lecture um, what we do see is that adolescents are having romantic relationships in our culture 67 percent of adolescents will at least say on a survey that they've had a romantic relationship um, within the past year and a half so certainly there are different definitions of what it means to have a romantic relationship but they're reporting that it's happening um, and it says that many of them last for a year and that's something that when you're a teenager feels like an extremely long period of time so you tend to choose partners that are similar in physical attractiveness and popularity one thing to think about here is that this continues to be true usually as adults the more committed the relationship the more likely we are to choose a partner that has a similar level of physical attractiveness so we don't usually look for someone who is much more attractive than us or much less attractive usually about the same level so romantic relationships usually teenagers are looking for these relationships because they want companionship intimacy and of course also uh, exploration into physical relationships um, which is an interesting subject a difficult subject to talk about certainly um, different people have different ideas about what is and is not appropriate in a teenage relationship and that is actually going to lead into activity seven I want to hear your thoughts and opinions on this um, do you think teenagers should be allowed to date now there are a couple of different ways you could think about this you could think about this from your perspective thinking back to when you were a teenager but you could also think about this as a parent should a parent from a parent's point of view is it a good idea to have your kids dating from a teenager's point of view is it a good idea for you to be dating uh, and then explain not just whether you think they should or shouldn't but why or why not and you might think about um, the impact on future relationships you might think about uh, the potential risks of uh, sexual violence or um, unplanned pregnancies that kind of thing so certainly a lot of things to think about here and I look forward to reading your responses one thing that we're interested in is sexual behavior in teenagers uh, and what predicts it so one thing we've already mentioned is that individuals who mature at an earlier age hit puberty at an earlier age are more likely to begin having sex at an earlier age we also see that you're more likely to be sexually active during your teenage years if you have parents and or peers um, that are permissive in their attitudes towards sex so if you feel like it's okay because my parents think it's okay or my peers think it's okay also having parents not monitoring adolescence so knowing that um, decision making is not always at its peak during this time in life and also hormonal changes and peer pressure and things certainly there is an argument to be made that if parents are not monitoring that increases the risk of things happening um, also thinking that your peers are having sex so certainly there is an aspect of this where you might engage in sexual activity that you may or may not be ready for because you don't want to be the only person in your friend group who is not having sex basically and then as we said physical maturity is associated and substance use so when we're talking about sexual violence which is going to be coming up 
we want to be cautious in the way that we discuss this. Certainly substances are involved in a lot of cases of sexual assault. That in no way says that it's the victim's fault. It's not. We can't always predict when sexual assault will happen. And certainly, regardless of the circumstances, it's never okay to blame the victim. It's inaccurate and dangerous to take the blame away from the perpetrator where it belongs. But having said that, though, we do know that there is an association between substance use and risky behaviors. And so this is something that uh, parents, in particular, need to be aware of and need to be talking to their teenagers about using substances. So you may see differences in the way that teenage boys and girls talk about their first sexual encounters. What we see is that girls often experience uh, mixed feelings. So maybe there's a component that they enjoyed and also a component that they didn't enjoy. Maybe because the experience didn't live up to their expectations uh, or maybe because they felt like there was some guilt involved. Certainly we have a sexual double standard where we tend to judge women um, who have more sex at an earlier age or have more partners. Uh, we tend to judge them more harshly than we do men who have the same behaviors. Uh, so that may play a role as well. But we typically see girls saying that their first sexual encounter was at least in a sense romantic in that it was with someone that they love. On the other hand, boys are more likely to say it was just a casual experience. So this may be something where we've had a breakdown in communication or where we are just seeing the situation the way we want to see it. Girls tend to think that the first sexual encounter happens more in a committed relationship. Boys tend to think less committed here. Um, but usually boys report having those early experiences being positive and perhaps thinking more about kind of recreational sex. So focusing less on the commitment there. And part of that may be a self-fulfilling prophecy. We tend to expect boys to be more sexually promiscuous and we're more accepting of that. And so perhaps that's why we see these outcomes. Now, um, regardless of your thoughts about whether or not teenagers should date, we know that there are some um, unfortunate circumstances that can come up when teenagers are having sex. And not that dating necessarily has to involve having sex, but we certainly know that they often go hand in hand. So it says that roughly one in six U.S. teenagers becomes pregnant, um, teenage girls. One thing to think here is that as a whole, as a country, our teenage birth rate is going down. But that's as a whole. Um, we often see southern states being higher than other states in um, their teenage birth rate. Um, part of this may be a difference from location to location in the use of contraception, and this is, of course, correlated with sex education. Now, I want to say that I understand why people want to use abstinence-only education. Uh, I personally don't think it's a great idea for teenagers to be having sex, and I understand the concerns about the dangers that can be associated. Having said that, though, we don't want to tell our kids that we are condoning them having sex, but if you don't provide them with education, then they're more likely to have bad outcomes. Some of these teenagers are going to have sex regardless of how you teach them, and if they don't have good information about how to do this safely, um, then we can see an increase in things like unplanned pregnancies but then also um, things like STDs. Uh, so certainly there is an illusion of invulnerability here. We talked about where teenagers think bad things happen to other people. And so perhaps because of that, um, teenagers are not engaging in safe sex or maybe because they don't know how to engage in safe sex. Of course, if you ask me, I feel like sex education is something that is primarily the parent's responsibility, but I tend to come down on the side of parental responsibility in most arenas here, all right? So, uh, as I said, we're going to talk about dating violence. Um, this is something else to keep in mind. Teenagers are not necessarily um, trained with the best coping skills about how to handle problems when they arise. 25%, um, I mean, that's a pretty high number uh, of teenagers are reporting experiencing some type of violence in dating relationships, which could be physical, sexual, emotional, or a combination of that. Now, we do see that uh, girls are more likely to be the victims of violence, which I think is true, but I think also part of the reason that we see that is um, we have kind of a stigma 
against boys uh, reporting that they're being abused. I'm sure that it happens, but it might be something that happens less um, because of that stigma. Uh, risk factors here, uh, substance use, once again, it is never okay to mistreat another person regardless of the situation, whether or not the person has had a substance does not make it okay, and that's not what I'm saying. But it is a risk factor for someone to be intoxicated. So I would encourage you, and I would encourage you to encourage others, um, to be cautious about um, maintaining your sobriety and in what environments you use substances. Um, also, it talks about it being a risk factor of um, having the stereotype of girls being passive, kind of the idea that uh, girls are expected to uh, allow their partners to have more control in the decisions about when uh, and what happens. And so I think we should encourage our daughters to stand up for themselves in this way. Um, and one thing to note is that boys are more likely to engage in violent behavior if they have been abused or if they have seen other people being abused, uh, maybe because they don't know what's okay and what's not okay because they haven't had um, appropriate healthy role models so they could be modeling some of that violence that they've seen. So it is important to communicate clearly about sex and I think this is hard because it's difficult for adults to communicate clearly, especially about sex. And so teenagers who are not necessarily prepared for this can certainly have a hard time. You should have an understanding of what you're comfortable with and what you're not comfortable with. And you should be very clear about this with your partner, making sure to communicate that and have a policy. Um, you should not be alone with someone, certainly not intoxicated around people that you haven't had these conversations with and that you don't trust. Uh, once again, that's not an excuse for someone uh, to assault someone. Certainly wouldn't want to blame the victim, but you do want to try to um, put yourself in a safe situation. Uh, be prepared if you have to object uh, to speak up and to not be ashamed of that. Um, one thing to think about is that consent is not consent unless it can be withdrawn. So if you think about a research study, when you sign an informed consent form, I'm going to be part of this research study. Part of that consent form will say that you can leave at any time. Even if you say, yes, I'm going to be part of this research study, they can't hold you there. They can't keep you there. You have to be allowed to leave. The same is true about sexual behavior. Just because you said yes, it's not consent unless the person can change their mind. And you should have a right to do that. Um, make your objections known and don't be afraid to use whatever force is necessary. Um, once again, I want you to be safe. And these are a few tips. Certainly we can't prevent all cases of assault or know exactly who will be a perpetrator, but we want to try to avoid those situations um, whenever possible. All right. I feel like that's probably a good place to stop for today. So during our next lecture video, we're going to carry on uh, at this point. So remember that you do have an activity that's going to be due by Friday at 5 p.m. Uh, email me. Let me know if you have any questions or concerns. Otherwise, I will talk to you guys during the next lecture video. Y'all have a great day.